Today we're going to do a Bible study entitled, How to Recognize the Coming Antichrist. And one of the questions that will be answered in this study today uh, that has been sent in is, why even teach on the Antichrist? Why even preach on the Antichrist? If you're a Christian, if you're living ready to meet the Lord, if the rapture is the next major prophetic event, then the Antichrist is really immaterial to us as believers. Well, the answer to that is a biblical and strong no. There is a major reason why we study, preach, and teach on the Antichrist, and you're going to learn that today. But for our text, let's go into 1 John chapter 2. If you're a new Christian, that's in the New Testament. And it's not far away from the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 2, and go down to verse 15, and let's read through verse 18. Again, today's Bible study, how to recognize the coming Antichrist. 1 John 2 and 15, there the Bible says, Stop loving this evil world and all that it offers you. For when you love the world, you show that you do not have the love of the Father in you. Verse 16, For the world offers only the lust for physical pleasure, the lust for everything we see, and pride in our possessions. These are not from the Father, these are from this evil world. And this world is fading away. If you have your highlighter, I would ask you to highlight that. This world is fading away. That's such an important statement in light of eschatology and end time events and Bible prophecy to understand that the world is not going to make a comeback, as I hear many preach and teach. The world is fading away. Now, that's bad news for the world, but it's not bad news for the church. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that the path of the just, Proverbs chapter 4, the path of the just, which is the righteous, the redeemed, those who are in Christ, those who have repented of sin and received Jesus as Lord and Savior. The path of the just is like a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. And so the light and the glory and the vision of God's eternal kingdom is not going to fade. It's going to shine more and more. And you need to attach yourself to that kingdom of God if you want to be secure in these last days. Let's go back to verse 17. This world is fading away along with everything it craves. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the end of the world has come. And in verse 18, I want you to highlight two words in particular in verse 18. The first word that I want you to highlight in your Bible is the word Antichrist, singular, and capitalized. And make note of that. Antichrist in the Bible is capitalized here, and it is singular. And then highlight the word Antichrists, plural, with a small a. And we'll come back to that, because that question has been sent in and asked on many occasions. Why does the Bible speak of Antichrist singular with a capital A and also speak of Antichrists plural with a small a? Great question. Let's begin today, and as we begin, let's just take a moment to pray together. Father, we never open up the Bible without an awareness of our dependence upon you. Everything we have, everything we ever hope to be, we owe it all to the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your eternal word. The Bible speaks 
of its authenticity, saying heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And we also have learned through our years of serving you and studying Holy Scripture that whatever you put in the Bible deserves our attention and deserves our study, even as the Apostle Paul told Timothy, his son in the ministry, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we ask that by that same Holy Spirit that you would help us today to carefully and clearly explain and to divide eternal truth and sacred truth in a way that's pleasing and accurate in your eyes. I pray for every listener. My prayer, Father, most of all, is that every one of them would live every day ready to meet the Lord. And if there are those who, through some means, have been directed into this time of Bible study who are not sure as to where they stand with the Lord, or perhaps someone who has run from God, maybe a Christian who once knew the Lord, but something in life has happened, and they have strayed away from God. My prayer is that today people would feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the loving call of God and that they would come home today before it's eternally too late. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for we ask it all in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. By the way, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and... Uh, because of recent viral videos, uh, a multitude of people are connecting with the ministry and we're hearing that repeatedly. Uh, I am not a Christian or I don't go to church or I'm not religious or I don't come from a religious home, etc. Or I'm just now starting to read the Bible because of COVID and pandemic issues have caused some people to pick up a Bible, etc. But if you're one of the multitude of people that are discovering this ministry and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, regardless of what I preach, regardless of what I teach, in all platforms, whether it be in one of our live Lost Lamb events or you find us on YouTube or Facebook Live or podcast channel or whatever social platform you discover us, I pledge to you that regardless of the subject, including today, I will always make the gospel clear and I will explain to you carefully how you can get right with God and know that you have peace with God. Because when it's all said and done, you need to be able to lay your head to the pillow at the end of every day and know that you're ready to meet the Lord. And some of you may not have that peace and certainty and security. And when I'm done today, I'm going to take time to pray with you. So. I hope that you'll be patient as we go through this study and then at the conclusion we're going to pray together and make that clear. How to recognize the coming Antichrist. As you've heard me say repeatedly through the years, I genuinely believe that we are living in the final moments of human history. And the final prophecies of the Bible, as we know from past studies, are going to escalate in speed as we approach the end of time. How do we know that? Well, for example, in many passages in the Gospels, Jesus compared the final prophetic events and he said they'll be like birth pains, which means they will increase both in number and they will increase in intensity. There is a prophetic escalation as we get closer and closer to the final events of Bible prophecy and we are living in that time. The next major prophetic event is an event called the rapture of the church and it is a signless event as all of my students and followers know. The rapture is a signless event. Jesus said, In an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. The Bible tells us, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 
44. And as I stated moments ago, there's nothing more important in all of the world than knowing that you're ready to meet the Lord. Bible prophecy is not given to scare us. It is given to prepare us. But don't miss this. Bible prophecy is not given to make us academically and spiritually more intelligent. Many people study eschatology and Bible prophecy, and it's simply a mental ascent to intellectual spiritualism, and that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of Bible prophecy is to motivate us primarily to live ready to meet the Lord, and the prophesied accurate signs of the times help us to know where we are at, because Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 24, you'll know when it's nigh, even at the door. What I'm about to say is incredibly important, so let me have your undivided attention for a moment. Uh, it is very possible, and in my opinion, probable, that the Antichrist is alive and well even as I'm speaking, hidden somewhere in the shadows of political identity, the Antichrist is waiting in the wings. I want to say that again because I know that's a, a provocative statement to say the least. But I believe that possibly, and as I've stated, in my opinion, probably, that we are so close to the rapture of the church that whoever the Antichrist is, is probably already involved either in the realms of politics or possibly in the realms of world finances or possibly in the realm of religion or denominationalism, hidden somewhere in the shadows awaiting his appointed time. Because as you're going to learn today, the Antichrist cannot and will not be revealed until after the rapture of the church. Uh, a notable scholar, he's uh, gone home to be with the Lord many years ago, but his name was Dr. A. W. Pink, P-I-N-K, Dr. A. W. Pink. And I have uh, several of his commentaries in my personal library but in studying, I came across a statement by Dr. Pink, and uh, I thought it was worth reading to you. Here's what he said, quote, Across the varied scenes depicted by prophecy, there falls the shadow of a figure at once commanding and ominous, under many different names, like the aliases of a criminal. His character and movements are set before us, end of quote. I'm going to say something from my heart, and I hope you won't judge me for saying it, because I love America. I live in America. I love the red, white, and blue. Uh, I honor this nation. But I have to be honest with you when I say that I'm truly surprised that in recent years, how quickly our nation as well as many great nations of the world, have abandoned the foundations of their Judeo-Christian values and have fully and totally embraced what the Bible calls the spirit of the Antichrist and that coming political and global system that is defined for us in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. I am just being honest and transparent. I didn't think that in my lifetime I would see this rapid, escalating descent of America into the abyss of the system of the Antichrist described in Revelation 13. And uh, by the way, uh, if you've never listened to one of our teachings, uh, I'll repeat it twice so that you can write it down, or if you're listening, you can remember it and make note of it later. But please look up and listen to one of our teachings entitled, 
the five political agendas of the last days. The five political agendas of the last days. And it is literally a word-by-word -word exegesis straight out of the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation because Revelation 13 reveals those to us. And by the way, those five political agendas of Revelation 13, number one, the Bible tells us in those five political agendas there will be a one world leader and of course that's the Antichrist. Number two, there will be a one world government. Number three, the Bible tells us that there will be a one world monetary system. Even this week, I have seen in the news that our current government and current administration are trying to uh, escalate the move from actual cash to digital currency and advocating uh, how important it is that we move away from the use of currency, tangible currency, physical currency, and move to a total digital platform, which as you might imagine is just one of the steps of evolution in the process of moving towards the mark of the beast and a one world monetary system. But the Bible prophesies those five political agendas, a one world leader, a one world government, a one world monetary system, and it also prophesies a one world religion. That's why there is such an attack, not only in America, but around the world upon churches, upon gathering, upon preachers. You have watched in recent weeks and months pastors put in prison for having church services and praying for people with needs and preaching the gospel because laws and mandates have forced them into a position where the response in the book of Acts was, we ought to obey God rather than men. And many people in spiritual leadership and in various countries of the world are not aware of the fact that this is a part of the coming Antichrist system. And we are seeing these things escalate and it saddens my heart. But at the same time, it causes a fire of fervency to be lit in my spirit and continually I feel the passion and the urgency. Paul said, by every means available, we must preach the gospel. And here at Lost Lamb Association, we are fully committed to escalating, not winding down. There is no retirement plan in my schedule. There has never been a board of trustees meeting where we have discussed my exit plan. I am going to preach and teach the gospel and do my best to win men and women and boys and girls to Jesus until there is no breath left in my lungs. I will preach, hopefully, until the rapture of the church. You retire from a secular job, but you cannot retire from a sacred calling and a holy vision. I do not have a secular job. I have a sacred vision and a holy calling that drive my every motive. And we are watching America and many of the great nations of the world moving towards that five political agenda status of Revelation 13 and it's prophesied in our text. Look at verse 17 again. The apostle John prophesied that. He said, this world is fading away. The nations of our world and their godless leaders are hopelessly marching in step together towards the five political agendas of Revelation 13 and they are setting the stage. Either knowingly or unknowingly, they are setting the stage whereby the Antichrist will easily and quickly be revealed and promoted into that one world leader status. And they can neither speed it up nor can they stop it because the devil is not in charge of final Bible prophecy. The world is not in charge of final Bible prophecy. 
The governments of the world are not in charge of final Bible prophecy. The Democrats nor the Republicans in America are in charge of the final timing of Bible prophecy. But everything in the Bible, including Bible prophecy and all of its detailed and apocalyptic events, are controlled by the hand of Almighty God. Not even the angels in heaven know, Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 36. Let me answer a question, and I think it's a great question, and uh, you know, sometimes it would be easy to be offended by questions because some questions are not asked because uh, people want an answer. Many people ask questions in an accusatory fashion. For example, uh, many times I am asked, you know, how come you don't use exclusively the King James Version Bible? I, I read an assault from someone that uh, was a part of the viewership of, of the ministry just in recent days. And and uh, their accusation was, I can't believe that you don't preach out of the King James Version Bible. Well, let me tell you something. I love the King James Version. I grew up on it. I have memorized hundreds, maybe in excess of 2,000 verses out of the King James Version of the Bible. And I'm not going to relearn them in a modern translation. So many times when you hear me quote scripture, even as you've heard me in the last few minutes, when I quote scripture, almost without exception, you'll hear King James Version. But if you want a brief answer as to why I don't use or rarely use the King James Version, is because I'm an evangelist and my target audience is unchurched, unsaved, unreached people. That's my target audience as an evangelist. Unreached, unsaved, unchurched people. And the King James Version was written in 18th century uh, Elizabethan English. And in the 21st century, we don't speak King James language. There are many, and I, I know some of you will feel like you should drag me out and stone me for saying this, but it's the truth whether you like it or not. There are many modern translations that are as accurate as the King James Version, and in several cases, more accurate than the King James Version. And so I use a modern translation because I'm trying to reach people who need to understand the Bible, and part of my commitment is to make the teaching of the Bible as clear and as understandable as I possibly can. And uh, if you think I'm going to hell for not using the King James Version, then this probably isn't the ministry for you. Feel free to find another. It won't hurt my feelings. But I had a question recently uh, directed to me uh, by a minister that will remain unnamed. As most of you know, I don't attack people uh, in public. Uh, God has five specific callings that He gave to the church found in Ephesians 4. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. And if you'll notice of those five, none of them were defense attorney. God doesn't need a defense attorney. He's perfectly capable of defending anything that needs His holy defense. My job is to simply tell the truth. But I was asked this question, why even preach on the Antichrist? Shouldn't you just focus on Jesus Christ? Because you've heard me say in previous Bible studies that the essence of Bible prophecy, it's recorded in the book of Revelation, the essence of Bible prophecy is Jesus Christ. And that's factual. And I have never ever wavered from that, nor apologized or made an excuse for that. The essence of Bible prophecy is Jesus Christ and not the Antichrist. So I don't consider it criticism and it didn't hurt my feelings. I think it's a valuable question. Why even bother to teach and preach on the Antichrist? So let me answer that for you. Because in the Bible you will find, write it down, over 100 passages in the Holy Scriptures that describe the Antichrist, his origin, his nationality, his charisma, his character, his sexuality, 
his defeat, his ultimate death, and even his final judgment. In other words, the Bible has a lot to say about the Antichrist. And any true preacher worth the grain of salt that you listen to should preach the entirety of the Bible. Which is another thing that makes me smile if you're wondering why I'm smiling. I was trying to keep it back, but I failed, so I better explain to you the smile. Uh, my smile is almost continually, regardless of what I teach on, there will be somebody in the comments section on various social media platforms that will say, well, you know, he said such and such, but he left out this, he left out that, he left out, he should have said this, he should As if in one Bible study I can cover every doctrine in the Bible. As you've heard me say before, anybody with an IQ above room temperature knows that you cannot in one Bible study do an exhaustive study of any subject, let alone the entirety of the Bible. So uh, it doesn't hurt my feelings when I get those accusations, and they are plenteous. In fact, the more the ministry is known and the more views, I mean, it's staggering to me that it looks like we are over one million views. Uh, on social media just in the last week. And so as you know, if uh, a million people plus are watching in less than a week, not all of them are going to be friendly. There are many that have uh, unpleasant things to say, and it doesn't hurt my feelings. You don't stay involved in world evangelism for uh, four decades of your life with not developing a thick hide. And so feel free to ask questions. It won't hurt my feeling. Uh, I need to bring something up as a reminder because of the fact that I'm hearing literally hundreds of responses of people that have just discovered us. And so as I've been praying that God would help me uh, both to clarify uh, Bible truths and to teach in a way that uh, even the person who's opening the Bible somewhere around the world for the first time can clearly understand uh, but those of you who are my students and my followers, you have many times heard me refer to the law of proportion. I want you to write that down if you don't already have it. The law of proportion. I'm answering the question, why preach on Bible prophecy, and especially the Antichrist, if all we need to do is just preach on Jesus Christ, get saved, and be ready. As I've already shown you, there are over 100 passages in the Bible that God gave us by the Holy Spirit without error that focus upon multiple details of the Antichrist. So the law of proportion, in fact, uh, let me give it to you word for word if you're hearing it for the first time and listening through some platform and you're wondering what in the world is the law of proportion when it comes to Bible study. The law of proportion is simply a theological term, but here's what it means if you want to write it down. It means you can discover the importance of a subject in the Bible by how much attention is devoted to it. The law of proportion. Very, very important to know that. The law of proportion simply states that you can discover the importance of a subject in your Bible by how much attention is devoted to it. So by the definition of the law of proportion, if God in the Bible gave us over 100 passages on the Antichrist, then He intended for us to have a functional working knowledge as to the Antichrist. Now this is my opinion. You can take it or leave it. I personally believe that the reason why he wants believers to have a functional, fundamental, working knowledge of the Antichrist is not so that we can identify him particularly and say, this must be him, because that is a, a foolish game that has been played far too often in the modern church that has no profit. Uh, will not know who he is. If you're a believer, you'll be raptured before he's revealed. We'll come back to that. But I believe the main reason why we are given so much on the subject of the Antichrist 
is so that we might understand the political, economic, religious shift in the last days that we are currently involved in like a whirlwind to motivate us to understand, number one, how important it is to live ready to meet the Lord, and number two, how important it is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ before it is eternally too late. Now, in the pages of the Bible, uh, the Scripture gives us ten specific titles of the Antichrist. And uh, I'll give them to you. Uh, some of you on various social media platforms are going to need to hit pause and rewind. But write them down. Maybe perhaps put them somewhere in your Bible notes or in the margin of your Bible. But here are the ten biblical titles that we find given to the Antichrist in the Scripture. And it's important for you to know that so that when you're reading passages and you hear one of his titles, you'll see, oh, that is referring to the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, he is called the little horn. The little horn. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 23, he is called the king, insolent and skilled in intrigue. The king, insolent and skilled with intrigue. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, he is called the prince who is to come. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, he is called the one who makes desolate. In Daniel chapter 11, verses 36, all the way down through verse 45, he is called the king who does as he pleases. In Zechariah chapter 11, verses 15 through 17, he is called a foolish shepherd. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, he is described as the man of destruction. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8, he is then called the lawless one. The lawless one. In Revelation 6 and 2, he is called the rider on the white horse. And in Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2, he is called the beast out of the sea. The beast out of the sea, or the first beast. Uh, Revelation 13 is such an important chapter uh, not that any of the chapters of the Bible are less important, but when you're studying particular subjects, when you're studying the Antichrist and those five political agendas that I mentioned earlier, Revelation 13 is the king of all of the chapters in the Bible in describing that. Because in Revelation 13, for the very first time, the unholy trinity is revealed. And so when you read Revelation 13, by the way, Revelation 13 takes place after the rapture. We know that the church is never mentioned again after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. Uh, chapters 4 and chapters 5 are important as we begin to move an in information as a prelude to the tribulation period. Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 18, that is the tribulation and the great tribulation. Uh, by the way, just a quick question. Somebody asked me this today in social media that had just discovered our ministry. Sometimes you use the term TIFF, the tribulation, and sometimes you use the term the great tribulation. Is there a difference? Well, let me just quickly explain that to you. It's a great question. Uh, many times in theological circles, uh, that seven-year period of time, by the way, the chronology of things that are about to transpire, the next major event is the rapture of the church. Immediately after the rapture of the church is a seven-year window of time called the Great Tribulation, or some theologians call it the Tribulation. I don't have issue with either. I don't think God's going to send anybody to hell uh, for using what they may deem to be proper in proper usage. And then after the great tribulation, the second coming of Christ, 
after the second coming of Christ, a 1,000 year period of time called the millennium, after the millennium, the final judgments, and after the final judgments, the eternal kingdom of God, his rule and reign shall be forever and forever. But listen carefully. Some prophecy police, that's what I call them, some prophecy police who insist on perfect verbiage. Now, I, I insist on perfect doctrine and nobody's perfect, but we should strive for per perfect teaching, perfect clarity, perfect doctrine. But there are some who, it seems they've been gifted, their job in the world is to scour ministries and correct them on every little nuance of, of what they deem to be sacred. But the seven years can be referred to as the tribulation period, and often is, by eschatology scholars, Bible scholars that teach on the end times. That's what eschatology is. It is the study of the last days and the end times and Bible prophecy. But the seven year period is divided into two three and a half year periods. And so many insist on the first three and a half year period as being called the tribulation and the last three and a half years as being referred to as the Great Tribulation. I'm fine with that uh, because it is true that the last three and a half years are going to be far worse in judgments, in death, in apocalyptic events, far worse than the first three and a half years. And uh, Jesus actually said that. He said, if God had not shortened the days, none could survive. And so I have no problem if you refer to it as the Great Tribulation or the Tribulation or you refer to the first half as the Tribulation and the second half as the Great Tribulation. None of the above melts my ice cream. I'm fine with it. Whatever makes you happy as long as you understand what's going to transpire. And he is called the beast, the first beast in Revelation 13. By the way, the unholy trinity is revealed in Revelation 13. The first beast is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. And the dragon is Satan. In Revelation 13, for the first time, the unholy trinity will be revealed. The first beast in Revelation 13, the Antichrist, if you're taking notes. The second beast in Revelation 13, if you're taking notes, the false prophet. And the dragon in Revelation 13 is Satan. That is the unholy trinity. Of course, the holy trinity, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Satan has an inferior, lesser counterfeit to everything God endeavors to do. And in Revelation 13 and during that time after the, tribula or after the rapture and in the tribulation, the unholy trinity will be revealed. Uh, one of the great scholars that uh, I study and uh, think highly of, I believe he's uh, currently still uh, one of the professors of eschatology at Dallas Theological Seminary, but his name is Dr. Mark Hitchcock. And he pointed out the comparison that the counterfeits that exist between Jesus Christ and the Antichrist and let me read them to you because they're rich. He writes, Christ had miracle signs and wonders. The Antichrist will have counterfeit miracle signs and wonders. Christ appears in the millennial temple. The Antichrist will sit in the tribulation temple. Christ is God. The Antichrist claims to be God. Christ is the lion from Judah. The Antichrist has a mouth like a lion. Christ makes a peace covenant with Israel. The Antichrist makes a peace covenant with Israel. Christ causes men to worship God. The Antichrist causes men to worship Satan. Christ's tribulation followers are sealed on their foreheads. The Antichrist's tribulation followers are sealed on their foreheads or right hands. Christ has a worthy name. The Antichrist 
has blasphemous names. Christ is married to a virtuous bride. The Antichrist is married to a prostitute. Jesus Christ sits on the throne. The Antichrist will sit on a throne. Christ has a sharp sword from his mouth. The Antichrist has a bow in his hand. Christ rides on a white horse. The Antichrist will ride on a white horse. Christ has an army. The Antichrist also has an army. Christ suffered a violent death. The Antichrist will suffer a violent death. Christ was resurrected. The Antichrist, it seems, will also be resurrected. Christ has a second coming. The Antichrist has a second coming. Christ has a 1,000 year worldwide kingdom rule on this earth. The Antichrist has a three and a half year worldwide kingdom on this earth. Christ is a part of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as I just mentioned. The Antichrist is a part of the unholy trinity, Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. Christ is crowned with many crowns. The Antichrist, the Antichrist is crowned with ten crowns. Christ is the King of Kings. The Antichrist is called the King. This gives us just a little bit of biblical information. As I've mentioned, there are over 100 passages in the Bible on the Antichrist. But this gives us a good outline on how we will recognize the Antichrist in these last days. In my next study with you, I'm going to continue on our study on the Antichrist. And I want to pause here because for time's sake, uh, there's far too much information to get into part two. But in the next teaching, I will be teaching on the subject of 10 unique biblical facts about the Antichrist. Uh, because the Bible actually gives us remarkable detail about the Antichrist. Let me just give you uh, one example, perhaps as a teaser going forward as to where we're headed. Did you know that the Bible actually describes the sexual preference of the Antichrist? And the Bible teaches us, as you will see, that more than likely he will be a homosexual. And many people don't know that the Bible teaches that about the Antichrist, which helps us to better understand why all of a sudden in American culture and around the world, the subject of homosexuality and lesbianism and the aggressive agenda of the LGBTQ plus and so on and transgenderism and, and all of the things that are being taught in our schools to our children and colleges and universities. Why all of a sudden has this become such a main point of contention when in almost all of human history it was not. It is a part of the agenda of the coming Antichrist and as you'll learn in the next study the Bible seems to clearly infer there are only two options but the weight of scholarship seems to infer that the Antichrist will be a homosexual and that is in the Bible and I'll teach it to you. And so our upcoming study, the very next study that we'll do as we continue on the subject of the Antichrist is 10 biblical facts about the Antichrist. I want to close today's study on how to recognize the coming Antichrist by reading a passage out of 2 Thessalonians 2. And if you have your Bible, I want you to open to it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and go down to verse 3. The Bible says, don't be fooled by what they say. This is the Apostle Paul's second letter to the church at Thessalonica that is a very young church. Some scholars say just weeks old, some scholars say just months old. But it is a church in infancy. 
And Paul is writing his second letter to them. And he writes in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God. Now this is referring to the end times. This is referring to the arrival and political promotion of the coming Antichrist. This is what Paul is writing about, literally writing Bible prophecy. He said, that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. Pause right here. End time politics are going to bring destruction. End time politics are going to become more and more and more divisive and destructive, as is plainly seen by anyone with eyes open. Why? Because we're headed towards the revelation or the revealing of the Antichrist system and the Antichrist. But notice that it said that before that happens, before the Antichrist is revealed, there is going to be a great rebellion against God which we're seeing in our own nation and around the world. Let me read on. He will exalt himself, the Antichrist. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Pause right there. There is the biblical passage, and there are others, but there is one of the biblical passages in Bible prophecy that foretells a coming one world religion. The Bible says when the Antichrist arise, he'll defy all world religions and set himself up in the temple of God claiming that he is God. Let's read on. Don't you remember that I told you about all this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back. Pause again. Bible prophecy tells us that there is something in the earth today that is holding back or restraining the revealing of the Antichrist. Let's read on. And you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. Again, very important to understand in your study of Bible prophecy and end time events that God is in charge of timing. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all of the political agendas attached to that coming stage are not in control. God is. He can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly. And it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. What is it in the Bible that has to be removed before the Antichrist can be revealed? What is holding back and restraining the full wicked prowess of this end time political agenda? It is the spirit filled church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until the church age ends, the Antichrist world cannot begin. Jesus said in Matthew 16 to his 12 disciples, in a place outside of Caesarea Philippi, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Jesus said that there is coming a church age. That prophecy was fulfilled and inaugurated in Acts chapter 2. There in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, that was the birthday and the launch of the holy church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When does the church age end? The church age ends at the rapture of the church. You and I are currently living in the church age. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So as long as the church is on the earth, 
it will prevail and it will build. It will move forward and upward until the rapture of the church. And the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the Spirit-filled church of the living Christ is raptured from this earth. That's why it's so important that you live every day ready to meet the Lord because the rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye. Quicker than that, the fastest human reflex in the entire human anatomy is the blinking or the twinkling of an eye. You have no ability in your body to move anything quicker than the twinkling, the blink of an eye. And when the rapture takes place, you will either be ready in that moment or you will be left behind. Let's read on. This lawlessness is already at work secretly. It will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. That's the church. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until after the church is raptured, the great catching up of the church. Then it goes on to say, the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. The one who is holding it back, or as the New American Standard Bible says, he who now restrains is the Holy Spirit working in and through the church. And the church is in charge until the rapture. And until then, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and the system of this Antichrist's agenda cannot be revealed. Let me close by asking you a simple question. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've made peace with God? Many people ask me in my travels, how do you make peace with God? How do you know that you're right with God? How can you have an assurance that if the Lord were to come, that you'd be ready to go? How can you know that? Three things you have to know. Three things you have to do. Number one, you must recognize your sin. You have to know that you've sinned and recognize that. The Bible says all have sinned. There's not one person, including myself, who could stand up and say, I have never sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're the worst sinner in the entire world listening to me, I'm not here to accuse you or to make you feel guilt or to condemn you. Today I'm your best friend. I'm trying to help you to see how you can break the curse of sin in your life and the patterns of sin and get right with God. Number one, you have to recognize it. Number two, you have to repent of sin. Repent is a word we don't use much in the 21st century. But Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, unless you repent, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There has to be a day of repentance. What does the word repent mean? In its simplest meaning, it means make a U-turn. It means you're headed in the wrong direction, but you need to make a U-turn. How do you do that, Tiff? In childlike faith today when we pray, you can turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, and not by works, lest any man should boast. You have to come to Christ by faith and repent of your sin. And number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ. The most memorized verse in the Bible, John 3.16, says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That word perish in the original manuscript in the Greek means face judgment and wrath for unrepented sin. If you don't repent of sin, one day you're going to stand before God and meet Him as your eternal judge. But God doesn't want you to meet Him as your eternal judge. He desires to be your heavenly Father. But the only way to have right relationship with God is through faith in Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts in the New Testament, in the fourth chapter, 
The Bible said, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ alone is the Son of God. He came to this earth, lived, taught, died, was crucified, buried, rose again. But through the shedding of His blood, the curse of sin in your life can be broken all the way back in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us that the life of the body, Leviticus 17, is in the blood. He gave His life's blood to break the curse of sin in your life. How do you do that? Today you can pray a simple prayer of faith and give your heart to Jesus Christ. Will you do that with me right now? No matter what your sin, no matter what your past, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wouldn't you like to know today that you're ready for whatever happens in these last days? Pray with me wherever you're at right now. Just pray. Say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. And down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to be ready to meet the Lord. In these last days, I want to have peace with God. Today, I recognize my sin. You know everything I have ever done. And I'm willing to repent. In childlike faith today, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I receive Him as my Lord and as my Savior. And I receive salvation by God's grace as your gift. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I vow this day I will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh mm -hmm. 